All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a review of Chapter 4, Adjusting Entries. Just one moment. i got to grab my glasses. There we go. All right. So we have two questions here. Well, one question. Q. 4-1, which has two parts. So part one first. Um, again, the most important thing to do is one, determine the date, and two, determine how frequently they do adjusting entries. So in the beginning part, it says provide all the entries required for 2017. Now notice, it says provide all and all is in capitals. So they want the transactional entries as well as the adjusting entries. So keep that in mind if it says all, and I'm not usually going to highlight them, I putting it all in capital letters, make sure you provide exactly what is being asked for. So they want 2017 and for 2018 if the adjustment is an accrual. So they want the cash transaction in the new year. And then it says the year end is December 31st, so now we know what date we're standing in. And the company makes their adjustments annually, which is incredibly important. Oh, I did want, I knew there was something else. Wiley Plus, I did check the two questions that supposedly there is something wrong with. And I wrote the questions, and I couldn't find anything wrong with it. I don't think anybody else found anything wrong with it, but I definitely could not find anything wrong with it. So just be aware, I, it seems to be fine. All right, now we're back at it. Number one, the business purchased equipment. So now we know that they're buying equipment May 1st. So I've got May first 2017 for $35,000. It does not indicate how they purchased the equipment and because it doesn't you can do either. So what did we get? We got equipment which has future economic benefits so I'm going to put equipment. And what did we give away? We gave away either cash or a liability in the form of accounts payable or loans payable. I'm going to use accounts payable. 35000 and remember, I'm doing this entry because they asked for all entries in 2017, not just the adjusting entries. The equipment has a five-year estimated useful life and a $5,000 residual value, also called salvage value. The company began using the equipment on June 1st of 2017. So even though they bought it on May 1st, they didn't start using it, and I'm assuming it's not ready for use, until June 1st. So. Looking at this, remember we're using straight line depreciation because that's all we've learned. Original cost minus the salvage slash residual value, $5,000, divided by the number of years of use, five years. And then we have to multiply it times the number of months in use. They started using it June 1st, so that's seven months. So seven over 12, and that is equal to, anybody got it? I did not calculate it. $3,500. Did we have to have this right? Wait, wait, wait. June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Yes, seven months. And we're assuming that the June 1st date was not, not only the date they started using the equipment, but it's the first date that it was available for use. Right, because there's no indication that May 1st was the date that it was available for use. So remember, according to IFRS, we're required to start depreciating it as soon as it's available for use, even if it hasn't started being used. But because there's no indication in here, here I'm assuming June 1st is the date. So that is $3,500. Excellent. Now, we're at December 31st. What account do I debit and what account do I credit? Debit depreciation expense, absolutely, because we've had the use of the equipment. And as soon as I say the word use, we know that expenses have got to be involved because expenses, the definition is used, consumed, or incurred to help generate revenue. And we've used this. And then accumulated depreciation is credited. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So we've got depreciation expense for $3,500 and credit accumulated depreciation for $3,500. Which type of adjusting entry is this? Ah, uh, no, Andrew. The contra would indicate a contra account. So contra asset, a contra revenue, but it's not a type of adjusting entry. 
we went over the types of adjusted entry. Accrual, so Mark's got accrual, accrued expense. Everybody agree? You should know when I say that, that's, that's ba a bad thing. Um, so it is definitely not an accrued expense, just so you know. So how can we remember between accrual and the deferred? Deferred is when we have an asset and we defer recognizing the expense, delay it by recording it as an asset. So this is actually a deferred expense, also called a prepaid expense. Exactly. So uh, last week that would have been type number one. If you remember we numbered them, one, two, three, four, this would have been type number one. So think about the fact that we're delaying and, and it's recorded as an asset the same way a prepaid rent is recorded as an asset. So if anything's recorded as an asset first, that's your hint that it's a prepaid expense because it's recorded in the same place as a prepaid expense such as prepaid rent is. All right? Accrued also has to have a liability account and we don't have a liability account. Accumulated depreciation, what financial reporting element does that account belong in? So I'm going to say that again. Accumulated depreciation, what financial reporting element does that belong in? Asset. Thank you, Chelsea. So just a minute, I want to address something. So, um, okay, Priyanka, the reason it's not a contra asset is because contra asset isn't one of the five financial reporting elements. It's either asset liability, equity, revenue, or expenses. The contra asset is the type of account. It's not one of the financial reporting elements. So keep in mind, under the element asset, one of the accounts is a contra asset account, but that's a type of account, not an element. Uh, Mark, you gave me the financial statement that it shows up in, and I asked for accumulated depreciation. Remember that accumulated depreciation is not an income statement account. The depreciation expense is an income statement account, but the accumulated depreciation is on the statement of financial position under long-lived assets or non-current assets. All right. And I'd rather you guys, just so you know, I love when you guys make mistakes. I think mistakes are the only way we can learn. So I hope you don't mind if I'm pointing out your mistakes. It's not because I'm, you know, I think mistakes are fantastic. I've always taught my children that mistakes are a learning opportunity. They shouldn't be viewed negatively. They should be celebrated. There's actually a movie about that from uh, Walt Disney um, about celebrating mistakes. It's called something Meet the Robertsons or something like that. But anyway, they celebrate mistakes. That's what I believe in, celebrating mistakes. So I hope nobody is minds when I point out your mistakes and I correct them because I want to make sure you make your mistakes here where I can fix it rather than you make the mistake on a midterm or final exam where it's going to lose your marks. All right, so we got this one. We know it's a prepaid. And remember the prepaid expenses, it's also called prepaid, is also called a deferred expense. For some reason, it's that. There we go. All right, so let's do number two. Employees are paid. Oh, this is a good one. And I may add one more just to, just to, because I only did two here, but I'd like to do one more most likely. All right, so employees are paid $30,000 every two weeks on Friday. Important information. The last payment was made on December 22nd. So we know that December 22nd must have been a Friday. So we've got the 23rd, and that is Saturday. Then we've got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so that's 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Next time they're paid, it's going to be on the 5th. Um, how many days are we accruing for? Well, we're going to show that, we would accrue for any period of time before the 31st, so we've got the 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, which is five days, so five days exist in the current period. So we're going to take the $30,000, we're going to divide it by 10, we're going to multiply it times five, and that equals $15,000. So on December 31st, 2000 and what did we say? 17. What is the debit and the credit? 
Don't forget we've used their services. Thank you very much. Salary expense because we use their services. Salary expense for $15,000 for what we have used. And then I noticed we've got salaries payable also to people. Absolutely. Salaries payable. $15,000. Now this is the one that I recommend that students use in their, like, embedded in your brain, this is an accrued expense. And the reason I know it's an accrued expense is because it has an expense and it has a payable. So anytime you think accrual, you've got to think about this expense and payable combination. So this is an accrued expense. It's also called an accrued asset, adjusting entry. Now, they did ask us to do the subsequent cash transaction in 2018. So now we're on January 5th. 2018, what is the entry that we would do in order to recognize? Remember, we're always going to pay them 100%. So salary's expense is going to be debited. Absolutely. Now, why is salary expense going to be debited? Well, if we look here, we can see that they worked one, two, three, four, five days in the new year. So we still have to do five days. And then we've got salary payable. Absolutely. We've got to get rid of the salary payable, right? That salary payable is there. It no longer is owed because we've paid them. So we have to get rid of the payable, salary payable. And I always tell students, put the salary payable in, put the credit to all the cash in, and then you don't really have to spend any time calculating the salary expense in the subsequent period because it's telling you 30000 less whatever the payable is is going to be the amount of the expense. So there's no need to calculate the salary expense. All right, any questions about this? Are we good to move on? Um, was a lot, this example right here for, or the, the depreciation? The depreciation was a prepaid expense, Andrew, but this one is an accrued expense. Yes. All right, now I'm just going to make one up quickly. I'm a Phantom 3. Um, so let's assume that a company, same company, same company. So we have all the same parameters. So uh, same company borrowed, borrowed uh, $15,000 uh, in 2016, June 1st. Um, at, let's say, 6% interest, and interest is paid on the first of each month. Okay, do we need to do an entry for the 15000 So we've got yes, 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 no. I have to agree with you, Philip. The answer is no. Um, and Mark and Lauren, because that's right, it's 2016. We were asked to do all the entries in 2017, not in 2016. And often I catch you guys with this kind of thing, right? So be careful, because I asked you 2017, 2016. We don't have to do that. Do we have to do all the cash entries? And the answer is no, we don't have to do the cash entries. We only have to do the entry at December 31st. Now remember what I told you last week, 2017. What I told you last week is when you're thinking of interest, stand. Just imagine a big calendar on the floor. You're standing in December 31st. You look over your shoulder and you say, when was the last time I paid interest? And that would be December 1st. And when I paid interest on December 1st, was it for the month of December or the month of November? Exactly. So I have had the use of the money from December 1st until today's date, December 31st, and I have not paid for that use. So do I have to accrue for it? And the answer is absolutely, because I've had the use of the money for the whole month. Therefore, I'm going to take the 15000 I'm going to multiply it times 6%. 
Do I have to do anything else? Exactly. It's for a month, so I've got to divide it by 12. What is the amount here? $75. Okay, so I'm going to, on December 31st, debit the interest expense because I borrowed money, so I have I have the use of the money, that's an expense, $75, credit interest payable, $75. And you know what type of adjusting entry this is, correct? Exactly. An accrued expense, absolutely. And now we have to, because for all the accruals I asked for the cash exchange in 2018, we're now sitting at January 1st, 2018. It's going to be a debit and a credit. The credit is going to be cash because we would have to send cash out to the bank, $75. And what is the debit going to be? Well, we got an interest payable that's sitting there, but we now we pay it. So that has to eliminate the interest payable because we no longer owe the bank anything at all. I just wanted to throw that in because that seems to be an area where students struggle, so I thought we might as well add one. All right, any questions about accrual or are we feeling fairly confident? Thumbs up, thumbs down. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. So let's move on now to the next question on the agenda. The next question on the agenda is um, introduction to merchandising operation. What makes them more complex? Well, merchandising operations are more complex because inventory. Inventory makes the whole operating cycle more complex. So let's imagine that we start a business. What's the first thing we have to do? We have to purchase inventory. And if we can, we're going to purchase inventory on account. Then we have to pay for the inventory. Then we have to sell the inventory. And then what happens, we have to collect. on our sale and then we're going to purchase inventory and then we're going to pay for the inventory and then we're going to sell the inventory and then we're going to collect on the sale and then it's going to continue on. Inventory, it's purchase and sales, makes accounting for merchandising companies more complex than if we're talking about a service company. If we're talking about a service company, we can basically start a business and just provide our own services and have very few expenses. We don't have inventory that's sitting on our balance sheet or statement of financial position waiting to be moved over as an expense. So the whole purchasing, selling, and then collecting makes the merchandising company far more complex when we're looking at the income statement. All right. Remember, if you have any questions, stop me. So when we're buying and selling inventory, what becomes really important is two things, shipping terms and credit terms. Now, as individuals, we don't obtain credit terms from most companies. I mean, we can sometimes if you go to the brick and you buy, you know, a sofa, you can, you can finance it over, over a year. Um, or you might not pay for a year and then finance it after that and that kind of thing. If we go buy a car, we're financing it. But generally, we do not have terms. But when companies sell to each other, they generally provide credit terms. And the reason they buy, provide credit terms is because they want to be competitive with all their competition. And if the competition provides credit terms, then you're going to provide credit terms also. So you've got to think, and I'll give you a very good example. So Costco, I used to work for a company who tried to get into Costco and you had to make quite a few promises to Costco. You had to be able to supply them um, massive amounts of inventory, at, be at their beck, of call, beck and call when they wanted the inventory. And you also had to provide them with pretty advantageous credit terms and very low prices because Costco has very low margins on their sales, but they, they make their money through volume. 
and through their, their membership fees, but volume is mainly where they make their money. So anyone selling to Costco is going to provide credit terms. And so having knowledge of credit terms is really, really important. So let's cover credit terms first. So what would credit terms credit terms look like? And so a good example would be, let's say, 210 net 30. Now, this is not what everybody gets as a credit term. I might sell to, you know, 100 customers, and, and I'll give these credit terms to two of them, and to five other ones, I'll give different credit terms. The credit terms is dependent on my relationship with the customer and how well they have been paying me in the past. So there's a whole relationship thing here. It's not just everybody gets the same credit terms. But what do these credit terms mean? So it means a 2% discount if paid in 10 days. So if a company receives, and that's from the date of receipt, right? So let's do a timeline so that we can see this. And let's assume that on June 1st, uh, we deliver inventory. And don't forget, we're acting as a wholesaler, and we're selling, let's say, to a retailer. Or we're acting as a manufacturer, and we're selling to a wholesaler. So we deliver all the inventory on, on June 1st. So with these terms, as long as they pay, by June 11th. So notice what's happening there. I'm taking June 1st and I add in the terms 10 and that allows it allows the individual who's receiving the inventory to take a discount as long as they pay within this period of time. So if they pay within this period of time, they take the 2% discount. Now, what happens if they pay afterwards? Well, it says 30, so now we do June 1st uh, plus 30. Well, there's no such thing as June 31st, right? It only goes, so we're talking July 1st. If they pay by July 1st, they have to pay by July 1st. Here, pay the net. So net means no discount. Now, what happens if they don't pay? What if, what if they're in this period over here? Well, here's where we add interest to the account. This is where we start charging the customer, if we are the seller, this is where we start charging the customer interest on their overdue account, and we start chasing them down. So 210 net, which means the whole remaining amount, no discount, by day 30. And that's from the date of delivery. Any dates you see in the textbook, assume the date that they're giving you is the date of delivery. So remember, after June 11th, the company can no longer take the discount. And, and discounts are worth quite a bit of money. If you're looking at taking a discount, it is worth quite a bit of money when you're looking at it. Any questions about credit terms? Or are we good to move on, on to shipping terms? Excellent. Remember, if you have any questions, let me know. OK. So credit terms are very important because you might be a manufacturer who's selling to a merchandiser. Uh, you might be a merchandiser who's selling to a large chain of retail stores. You're going to offer these individuals credit terms. Keep in mind that if you're a small retail store, one location, you might not get any credit terms. I ran my own business for almost six years, and I never got credit terms. I'm not big enough, and it was just pay. You have to, you know, COD, pay, uh, cash on delivery. I just paid by credit card. So keep in mind that when we're talking credit terms, we're not talking about small, tiny little businesses. We're talking about big businesses. All right, so now let's look at shipping terms. Shipping terms have become so much more important with the massive amounts that we purchase from overseas because contents or inventory items may be on a ship 
for weeks at a time. And someone owns it while it's on that ship. The shipping company never owns the inventory ever, 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 ever. The shipping company is simply a transport and that's it. They have no ownership of that inventory. So you got to think that if you've got If you've got the shipper over here, and I use the word shipper instead of seller because sometimes um, somebody might receive inventory and they might ship it back, so they become the shipper. I don't want to say seller, I want to say shipper. So the shipper's doors are right here. So here's the shipper's doors. Okay? And this is called the shipping point. Now here is the receiver. And there's the doors, whoops, there's the doors of the receiver. And the doors of the receiver is called the destination. There are two ways that items are shipped. And, I mean, I'm putting a, a truck here, but you can just as easily think about a boat. And also, you've got to think that sometimes things are going to arrive on the boat and they're going to get on a truck and then they're going to be shipped even more. So, here we go. We've got the company, it's going from the shipper to the receiver, so in this direction. And the question becomes, once it leaves the doors of the shipper, who owns it while it's in transit? And the answer is, who, who, oh sorry, the answer is determined by the shipping terms. So this is F-O-B. That means free on board. And when those words are used, free on board, it always relates to the receiver. So free on board to the receiver until the shipping point. Well, the shipping point is right here. So it's not free at all. Because the moment, Mark, I, I, I just see in co-terms. What does that mean? Sorry, I was totally ignoring the chat area. And now I see this word, incoterms. What does this mean? Is it a spelling error? Shipping terms. Oh, OK. Yes, shipping terms determine who owns it. So FOB free on board, that's in relationship to the receiver, uh, at the shipping point. So immediately at the shipping point is when ownership transfers. So if that is true, If it's FOB shipping point, it's this receiver. The receiver owns, is responsible for it while it's in transit, and they pay the shipping costs. So they own it in transit, they're responsible for any damages in transit, and they pay 100% of the shipping costs. So you've got to think, while it's in transit, if it's shipped FOB shipping point, it means that the receiver owns it. The receiver has to include it in their inventory account. The receiver has to put it on their financial statements as a debit to inventory and a credit to accounts payable, even though they may not receive the inventory for weeks. Because somebody owns it while it's in transit and the shipping terms determine who owns it. Now, what if it's free on board until the destination? Well, the receiver is sure going to be happy about that because it means it's free on board to them until it arrives at their door right here. So if it's free on board destination, then it means the shipper owns, is responsible for, and pays all the shipping costs. So. Shipping terms are in credit in terms are trade terms that determine uh, in shipping laws where ownership changes. Oh, I didn't know that. Interesting. So in accounting, these are the terms we use. And absolutely, they are used to determine ownership. So this is one of the big issues and items that are taken care of when an audit is being done of a company because the critical issue is who owns the inventory while it's in transit and as I said many many purchases are made overseas now they could be you know in transit for a significant amount of time and if they are ownership has to be claimed and that ownership is important for the value of inventory on the financial statements
So these are the terms we use. If it's FOB shipping point, don't forget, FOB shipping point means receiver owns. FOB destination means that the shipper owns. Now, how can this become a little bit more complex? Wholesalers could be both shippers and receivers. A wholesaler purchases inventory from a manufacturer and then turns around and sells it to other entities, other companies. Generally, they might sell, or generally they do sell, to retailers. The retailer is not large enough to purchase inventory directly from the manufacturer, so the manufacturer sells large amounts of inventory to the wholesaler, and the wholesaler breaks up that inventory into smaller packages and sends it out to retailers. So a wholesaler will both be a shipper when they sell to a retailer and a receiver when they receive inventory from the manufacturer. And as such, that's where it gets complicated, and that's what we're actually going to do. We're going to do a very uh, comprehensive question that actually demonstrates exactly this. And we're going to deal with a company that is, it says tennis shop, but I'm going to assume that tennis shop is just another, you know, wholesaler. Because generally, a tennis shop would not give credit terms to their customers. They might, but it's unlikely. All right, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to turn to Q5-1. Now, I am going to give you guys a job because there's just not enough space on these whiteboards for me to do everything that I want to do. So I'm going to give you a few minutes. I would say you need, let's, let's give yourself, let's say, nine or ten uh, T accounts. All right, so I'm going to put them over here, but I'm just not going to fill them in. You guys are on the hook for filling them in. So, of course, we need some T accounts, so always there has to be a long one for cash, because cash is always one. So accounts receivable, right? So you're going to need a few of these, and then you're going to need at least two liability ones, I would assume, although I always like to have extras. And then you're going to need contributed capital, retained earnings, you need revenue, you need a bunch of expense ones. Yeah, that should be enough. Okay, so you guys are on the hook for filling in this. I'm going to put in the opening balances, but after that, for all the entries that we do, you guys are, are tracking the entries into the T accounts because I need the ending balances in order to create the statement of earnings. Do we really need the retained earnings and the common share ones? Uh, probably not, but I always put them in. There aren't any transactions. I know, I just, I'm, I'm very neurotic about this. It comes from a background as an accountant. Um, oh, I forgot inventory. Inventory is 5,400. We don't have accounts receivable, but we will. Common shares is common shares is 6,000. And retained earnings is sitting at 7,400. All right. So, and you're right. You do not need them. I'm just neurotic about it. So here's your T accounts. I'm no longer going to visit this. You guys are going to keep track and make sure that you follow through because I need the ending balances in order to do the trial balance and the statement of, um, uh, sorry, the income statement. Because at the end of this process, I want to create a single step income statement, which is what we did in chapter one, and then a multiple step in income statement, which is what we're doing in chapter five. All right, so I'm just going to do the entries. So names for the account, and then of course we have debit and credit. All right. Following a transactions occurred in April and May. So on April 2nd, they purchased inventory from Roberts Inc. for $4,900. Terms are 210 net 30 FOB shipping point. So what did we get? Absolutely. Inventory. Now, in the textbook, they call it merchandising inventory to separate from supplies inventory, raw materials inventory, or any other inventory. I'm just going to call it inventory, just to simplify it, instead of writing merchandising inventory every single time. There are companies who call it merchandising inventory. There's other companies who just call it inventory. 
So I'm just going to use inventory. So what did we get? We got inventory. What did we give away? We gave away an IOU, right? We gave away an IOU, so accounts payable, absolutely. So IOUs are represented by accounts payable. And how do we know we gave away an IOU? Because it doesn't say for credit or on credit. Exactly. Thank you very much, Andrew. As soon as we see terms, we know absolutely that this is on account. So from now on, I'm not going to tell you on account or for credit. If there's terms, you should know. I always put the terms underneath. You don't have to. Net 30, and then FOB, shipping point, and this is 4,900. Oh my goodness, 4,900, 4,900. All right, good. Uh, on the 3rd, April 3rd, uh, appropriate party paid $120 freight on the purchase from Roberts, Inc. Who is the appropriate party? Absolutely. The receiver or the buyer. Because it's FOB shipping point, so that tells us right away. So if that is true, we know the credit is going to be cash because it says paid, right? So that is cash. That is going to be 120. What is the debit? Absolutely. The debit is no. Mark, it is never shipping expense, and I'll explain why. In order for it to be shipping expense, you have to have used, consumed, or incurred something to help generate revenue. Have you used this inventory to help generate revenue as yet? And the answer would be no. So you cannot put the cost of shipping into an expense because it hasn't been used or consumed. In addition, think to yourself that you want to include in the cost of inventory all the costs necessary to make it ready for use. And that charge for shipping was necessary to make it ready for use, so it's added into the inventory account. Now, just so you know, in real life, do we have to write debit and credit when we do a journal, or can we just, oh, no, you can just indent. That's just a habit of mine, because I, I, when I teach, I like to always make it clear that it's a debit or a credit, but that is just a habit of mine, and it's totally unnecessary. Ah, I was about to say, in real life, there are many companies, not all companies, but there are many companies who simply expense the shipping costs. And I want to make clear why they do that. Those companies use standard costing. So they determine at the beginning of the year a standard cost for the inventory, which includes shipping and all other costs necessary to make it ready for sale. And so that's why they expense the shipping costs because they're already using standard costs. But in this case, we're going to do it the correct way, the IFRS way, which says we include all costs necessary to make it ready for sale. All right. No, no, um, no statement is needed here. So now we're on April 7th. And on April 7th, we received a credit of $100 from Roberts, Inc. for a damaged inventory that was returned. So we returned $100 of damaged inventory. What do we have to do? Always go back to the original entry and then reverse it. So previously, we had credited accounts payable. Now we're going to debit accounts payable because we load, owe them less. How much less? $100 less. And we're going to credit inventory because that inventory now is gone. So it no longer has any future economic benefit. So we're going to take it down by $100. All right, so now on the 11th, we paid Roberts Inc. the outstanding balance. I'm going to show you a step-by-step -step process I use to do this because I see too many mistakes, and I would prefer if we didn't make any. So April 11th, so step one, in discount period. So the first question I ask myself is, when I see there's a payment, either I receive a payment because I've been the shipper, or I, I make a payment because I'm the buyer. In this case, I'm the buyer. I'm going to ask myself these three questions every single time. So discount period. So received on April 2nd, terms are 10, this is 12, and today is the 11th, so we can take the discount. Since we can take the discount, I move forward with step two, amount paid. Amount paid 
if I'm the receiver, or, or received, if I'm the shipper. In this case, paid is the one that applies. So how do I calculate this? I take the order. I subtract any returns. Oh, this is so important. Subtract the returns. And then I multiply it times 100% minus the discount percent. If I do that, then I know I'm going to get the right amount that is going to be paid. So in this case, the order was 4,900. I subtract the 100, which gives me 4,800. I multiply this times 100 minus 2%, 100% 2 minus 2%, oops, okay, which is 98%. So this amount is going to be 4,704. Right? And 4704, sorry. And then step three, what's the discount amount? And that's going to be the 4800 minus the 4704, and that's going to be equal to $96. So now I've got all the information necessary to actually make an entry. Make sure you go through this three step process because the biggest, biggest problem I see is two things. Students do not recognize that they are outside or inside the discount period, so they either take the discount when they're not allowed it, or they don't take the discount when they should. Second thing that I see is students use the wrong amount because they forget about the returns. Right? If you forget about the returns, all your, all your calculations moving forward are going to be wrong. If you take 4,900, everything is going to be wrong moving forward. So those two errors are the most common errors, this one right here and this one right here. So think about the three-step process so that you make sure that you're going to get it right. All right, so on April 11th, what has happened, well, what did we get? We actually got back our IOU. So this is a debit to accounts payable because we got the return of our IOU. What's the total amount of our IOU? You should be able to see that on the TT accounts also. It's 4,800. So what did we give away? Well, we gave away cash and we gave it away for 4,704. Where does the discount go? Andrew is guessing inventory, inventory, inventory. Yes, it is inventory because when we take a discount, it makes the inventory cheaper. So $96 goes to inventory because inventory has now become cheaper because we were able to take a discount. So it's reducing the value of our inventory. Absolutely. All right. So now, April 13th, I'm showing you again a purchase. We are again the receiver, but this time I'm showing it for cash. You purchase inventory from Niki Sports Limited for $920 cash FOB destination. So this is a debit to inventory because we received inventory, which has future economic benefit. It's a credit to cash because cash is given away in payment of the inventory. That is nine, whoops, 920, 920. And this is FOB destination. And then it says the appropriate party paid $15 freight on the purchase from Niki Sports. Who is the appropriate party? Shipper, so no entry. Exactly. The shipper pays. So on April 16th, we put down no entry because we are the shipper. Sorry. The shipper pays. We are the receiver. And the shipper is paying, so the receiver does no entry at all. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to the 17th. Purchase supplies for $1,300 cash from Discount Supplies Limited. April 17th. What's the debits and what's the credit? What did we get? What did we give away? Supplies. 
and credit cash. Now, why did I put this entry in here? I put this entry in here because otherwise students start thinking that every single purchase is an inventory purchase, and that's not true at all. So be careful when you're going through a question that involves inventory. Don't get caught by putting everything into inventory regardless of what it is. All right. So, and I should ask, um, are you guys keeping up with your T account? Is everybody okay with that, or did I need to spend any more on this? Are we good to go? Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Okay. So now, we are at the 18th of April, and it says we receive a $100, sorry, we receive a $110 cash refund from Nikki Sports Limited for damaged merchandise that was returned. So going back, remember I said, always look at the purchase, here we go, always look at the purchase and reverse the purchase. If you're going to return inventory, reverse the purchase. So originally we had a debit to inventory because we received it and a credit to cash because we paid it. And now what's going to happen? Well, on the 18th, we're going to have a debit to cash because we're going to receive $110 cash. And we're going to have a credit to inventory because we got rid of the inventory so it no longer has any future economic benefits. All right, so notice the difference. If we're paying on account, then we're going to do a debit to accounts payable. But if we paid in cash, we do a debit to cash. Okay, so we're now on April. This was April 18th. We're now on April 20th. And remember I said one of the complicated things about dealing with a merchandiser is the fact that they are both shippers and receivers, buyers and sellers of inventory. So this is a good example of it. Sold merchandise to a customer for $6,800 on account. Terms, 110, net 30. The cost of the merchandise was $4,080. Shipping terms are FOB destination. OK, there's a lot in there. So when we are the seller, not the buyer, the seller or the shipper, whichever one you want to think about it in your head. There are two entries to be made. I call them the SSS entry, as a reminder, and the CCC entry. The sales entry to the sales revenue for the selling price of the inventory. The cost entry to the cost of goods sold for the cost of inventory. Because when you are a seller, you both have a selling price, but you also have what it costs you. A perfect example would be, my husband recently bought um, a set of, I don't know, their, their blades for his bandsaw, but it turned out they didn't fit. He bought them at an auction for $5. And he sold them on Kijiji for $45. Don't even go there. Um, so anyway, what was his sales entry? The sales entry would have been for $45, but his cost entry would have been for the $5 he paid for the blades. So. A SSS is a sales entry to sales revenue for the selling price, and the cost entry is the cost entry to the cost of goods sold for the cost of inventory. So let's do these two things. When we sold it, um, what did we get? Well, we sold it on account. I know that because there were terms, so I didn't need the word on account. The terms told me clearly. So we sold it on account. What did we get? We got the legal right to collect cash from our customers, AR. Absolutely. So here we go, accounts receivable. And the accounts receivable is for the 6800 right? Because that's the selling price. Credit, of course. Well, what did we get? The legal right to collect cash. What did we give away? We gave away inventory, which gave us the right to claim sales revenue because we did our job. So sales revenue, and that's 6800. So we've now got the sales entry. We now have to do the cost entry because what disappears from our statement of financial position? Inventory, absolutely. So we credit inventory because we gave it away in order to help us generate revenue. And that is for the $4,080. And as soon as I say it helped us, yes, cost of goods sold. Thank you very much, Chelsea. It, it helped us to generate revenue. We used or consumed something to help us generate revenue. And that is cost of goods sold. Just so you know, in other textbooks, it's also called cost of sales. 
So the cost of the sales we made or the cost of the goods that we just sold. So there's the two entries you always have to do as the shipper or as a seller. All right. I think that's good. All right, let's go to the 21st. The appropriate party paid the freight. Well, I haven't put down. I want to put the terms down. 110 net 30, and it was FOB destination. Okay, so now we've got it. All right, so on this date, April 21st, we need to make an entry, or we don't need to make an entry. Somebody needs to tell me. Do we make an entry? Freight out. So we're going to make an entry. Why are we making an entry? It is an expense, absolutely. So the shipper is responsible. We pay the freight because we are the shipper, absolutely. We're the seller. It's an expense because it helped us to generate revenue. So as soon as we say, well, why are we making an expense? Well, we ship something in order to generate revenue. And as soon as we do anything in order to generate revenue, we're allowed to claim an expense. We used the services of a shipping company to generate revenue. That's an expense. So this is going to be a debit to freight out expense and a credit to cash. And that was for $100. Absolutely. Okay, so moving on. Some of the merchandise purchased on April 20th, so we go back to, um, oh, it should have said some of the merchandise sold on April 20th with a sales price of $1,000 and a cost of $600 was returned. It was restored to inventory. So we put it back into inventory. So remember what I said. I said whenever we're going to do a return, return, you go to the original entry and you simply reverse it. But there's a catch here. When we are the seller, there's a catch. Does anybody, can anybody tell me what the catch is? If I'm looking at reversing these two entries, sales discount. No, Philip, it's not sales discounts. Because we just had a return. It's not called sales discount. We do. We put it back into inventory. Management does put it back into inventory, absolutely. Revenue and inventory, not same value. Well, no, because we've got a cost entry and a, we've got to, we've got to reverse the sales entry and then we reverse the cost entry separately. Sales allowances and returns. That's what the difference is. So you could say I should reverse this entry purely the way I see it right now? And the answer is no, we cannot. We do not use sales revenue in the reversal. In the reversal, we use sales. It's actually called sales returns and allowances, but you can flip it around the other way. I don't care. Um, we cannot use sales revenue. And I'll talk in one second about why we cannot use sales revenue. So we're going to reverse it. Always look at the original entry to reverse it. You're going to flip it, but there's a catch here. We can't use sales revenue. We're going to use sales returns and allowances. So on the 22nd, I'm going to reverse, so I'm going to do a reverse of the SSS, and I'm going to do a reverse of the CCC. So this is going to be a debit to sales, returns, and allowances. And that's going to be for the selling price, $1,000, and it's going to be a credit to accounts receivable because we don't no longer have a legal right to collect $1,000 from our customer because they return the inventory. Then I'm going to do a reversal of the CCC entry. And if I go back and look at this, this reversal is a pure reversal. Nothing changes. It's going to be a debit to inventory and a credit to cost of goods sold. I'm going to use the short form for cost of goods sold. Um, and that was $600. So let's discuss for a moment, if you don't mind, let's discuss why we're using sales returns and allowances. Somebody want to tell me why we're putting it in sales returns and allowances instead of sales revenue? It is a contra revenue account. What element does it belong in, though? 
No, it does not. I'm so glad you made that mistake, Andrew. And sometimes on the exam, I ask people, what is it? Is it, a, is it an expense account? So it's not an expense account because it was not used or consumed to help generate revenue. And remember, an expense account must be used, consumed, or incurred to help generate revenue. It's not a liability account because we no longer Sorry, we don't owe anybody anything. It is. It's a revenue account. It is a contra-revenue account. It belongs in the element revenue, but it's the type of account is a contra-revenue. The element it belongs in is revenue. And the reason it's contra-revenue is because it's contrary. It actually reduces revenue. And so it makes sense now because what's happening, we're reducing revenue by accepting inventory back. Uh, now, I'm going to go back. Chelsea, to keep track of what is returned and how much is being returned. Okay, so why do we have sales returns and allowances? And Chelsea, you're absolutely right. So think about Costco again. I don't know if any of you shop at Costco, but I'm sure you've returned something at Costco and stood in one of those long and onerous lines waiting to be able to return that product. And if Costco receives too many returns, because they track their returns very, very carefully, if they receive too many returns of a product, they simply remove it from their shelves and they'll never purchase from that supplier again, that particular inventory item, because high returns indicate that the product probably does not have the quality that is necessary for Costco to continue to carry it. So that's why, you know, you walk into Costco one week and I used to buy something there that I absolutely loved. And, and there's two reasons why Costco gets rid of stuff. One is because their returns are too high. And the second reason is their turns are not uh, high enough. So turns means how quickly people take it off the floor and buy it. Um, and my product, which was my favorite cereal in the world, uh, was removed because it just didn't sell well enough. Um, but yes, okay, so sales returns and allowances, we know it's a revenue account, the type of account is a contra-revenue account, it's not an expense account, and it's separate from sales revenue so that it can be tracked for information purposes. All right, so this is the return. Notice the difference between a return when we are, just a second, I'm going back here. So remember, this was the return when we were a buyer, okay? So that was the return when we were a buyer. Very simple. The return when we are a seller is a whole different ballgame, right? Here's the original entry when we sold it, and now here's the return entry. Again, reversal of the SSS and then a reversal of the CCC. Okay, and remember what SSS means. The sales entry to sales revenue at the selling price the cost entry to the cost of goods sold at the cost of inventory. Questions? Any questions at all? Or are we good to go on? Looks like we're good to go on. All right, excellent. Okay, so now um, we are on the 23rd. Sold merchandise to a customer for $5,600. New page. I'm going to turn my marker black again. Uh, so sold merchandise to a customer for six, $5,600. Terms 110 net 30. The cost of the merchandise was $3,360. Shipping terms, FOB shipping point. So what's going to happen here, we've got a... Where are we? April 23rd. We got a debit to a accounts receivable, a credit to sales revenue. This is for the selling price, 5600, 5600. And then, so this is the SSS. CCC, I've got the debit to cost of goods sold. I have a credit to inventory. That's for the cost of it. It is 3360, 3360. And this is 110 net 30 FOB SP. There we go. All right, so now, April 24th. Debit credit or no entry?
No entry. Absolutely. I thought I would fool you guys by putting the debit and credit in. No entry at all because FOB, don't forget, FOB, shipping point, indicates that it is the buyer who takes responsibility as soon as it leaves the shipper's door. So we are the shipper. We have zero responsibility. All right. 25th, received cash payment for inventory sold to a customer on April 20th. So we're going to go through, for sure, we're going to go through the three-step process again. So this is on April 25th. So step number one, we first have to say, is it in the discount period? So April 20th, and then we've got 10 days because the terms were on the, wait, 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 I'm just double checking this. Cash payment for April 20th, 110. So add 10 days, this is the 30th, the date today is the 25th, so we're going to take the discount. Step number two is the calculation. So the calculation, of course, we're going to look at the order minus any returns. And we're going to multiply it times 100% minus the discount. All right, how much cash are we going to receive? Because don't forget, we're the seller this time. How much cash are we going to receive? I leave it to you guys to. I got 5,742. Does everybody agree? So I'm just going to write it out here. I've got the 6,800. Subtract the $1,000, right? Because the fact is only 5,800 was sold to that customer. Multiply it times 100 minus the discount rate. Remember, the discount rate was 1%. So we're going to multiply this times 99%, and that equals 5,742. Step number three is what's the amount of the discount? Fifty-eight, absolutely. Be careful. Don't go back to this six thousand eight hundred. I've seen students do that. Don't do that. Stick with the five thousand eight hundred. So we took five thousand eight hundred and we subtracted the five thousand seven hundred and forty-two. So now we're on April twenty-fifth. So what did we get? We got cash, and the amount of the cash was five thousand seven hundred and forty-two. What did we give away? Well, we gave back the client's IOU because they had previously given us an IOU, an accounts receivable, credit the AR for the full amount of 5800 Where does the difference go? We know it's a debit. What account does it go in? Exactly. So we're the seller. It belongs in sales discounts. When we're the buyer, no. Does Sales discounts also belong to revenue element. Yes, it does. I was about to ask that question. What element does it belong in? Sales discounts belong in the revenue element. They are also a contra revenue account. So that's the type of account, but they belong in the element revenues. And we know that this is 58. Absolutely. And again, is it an expense? No, because it's not used, consumed, or incurred to help generate revenue. It is used to encourage someone to pay faster, but that doesn't generate revenue. It actually reduces our revenue, which is why it's a contra revenue account. Excellent. All right, so now on the 28th, let's move on. I hope I'm not going too fast and you guys are following along with your T accounts. Does anybody need to see a previous page or are we good to go? I should have been asking you if I could move on and I'm sorry. Everybody seems to be okay. All right, let me know if there's a problem. All right, so now we're on the 28th, April 28th. And it says, granted a $150 sales allowance from the sale on April 23rd, no merchandise was returned. So what is a sales allowance is the question. Any thoughts on this? What is a sales allowance? A discount, similar to a discount. It is a contra revenue account. We don't have 
well, we, we have an account called sales returns and allowances. Can someone tell me why allowances are put in with returns instead of with discounts? Because we've got a sales discount account and we have a sales return account, but we add allowances into the sales return account. Why don't we add them into the sales discount account? Does anybody know? Operating? No, that's not why. All right, so it, when you think about, I'll give you an example. I think an example will help. So I purchased a mattress from Sleep Country Canada and it arrived and they do a phenomenal job. They take away your old mattress and, and my box spring. They put little, um, so not one not used with net revenue. No, both of them, both of them are used with revenue, uh, sales. I'll, I'll deal with that in a second. So they brought me this mattress. Um, I was so excited about it. My children were little and they were bouncing on the new mattress and it was a little insane and, and you know, my son almost fell off the bed. Um, so they're taking out the old box spring and the old mattress and they've got little blue booties on their feet and I'm trying to keep, you know, everybody in check. Um, and then they leave and I'm going to make up the bed with the kids and I realize that there's a hole on the mattress on the wall side that I didn't see when they were bringing it in. And it's not a big hole, but it's a hole in a brand new mattress that cost me a lot of money, which, you know, was a huge amount of money. And I phoned them up and I said, I, there's a hole in the mattress and I want you to come and pick it up. And they said, we'll give you $250 if you keep it. So a allowance is money you throw at your customer to stop them from making a return. And that's why it's in with sales returns and allowances. Exactly. Exactly. Just heads up, people. I made them come and change the mattress. Because I was like, you know what? This is a $1,500 mattress and you're offering me $250. And if you take it back, there's no way you can sell it on your, your sales floor for even half price with a hole in it. So please don't throw $250 at me. You can throw like, $700 at me, but not 250 I made them come back and, and give me a new one. Um, but that's exactly what it is, and that's why it goes into sales returns and allowances. An allowance is money you throw at your customer to stop a return from happening, because you'd rather not have the product back. All right, and that's why it's in together. So an allowance is when we throw money at customers to stop them from returning things, because we don't want it back. So in this case, What's going to happen, so they gave, would a price match be considered a sales allowance? No, that's, that's considered a discount, right? So a sales allowance is when you've already given it to your customer and you want them to stop it from bringing it back. Nope, a quantity price discount actually shows up. That's a good question to you guys. I love these questions. Okay, so when we are here, nope. One more. Nope, oh, one more. Yes. When we are right here, and let me just highlight this for a second. When we are right here, this already is reflecting a purchase discount. A quantity price discount or a purchase discount, that's already reflected in the $4,900 when we record it when it's purchased. So there is no separate quantity price discount account. Whenever we buy something, we put it at whatever price we bought it for after the, the quantity discount or anything like that. Um, now, uh, Michaela, it prevents the customer from returning it and buying it from a different seller. Um, yes and no. It's really just to stop the company from returning it because companies know that if they get it back, they probably won't be able to sell it again. So IKEA accepts back all their furniture, right? But when they accept back that furniture, it's problematic for them. Often it's no longer in the original box in perfect condition and, and it was returned for a reason. Well, how are they going to get rid of it? They're going to have to put it on their as is section and probably at 33% off or 50% off. So it's far more uh, profitable for the company to throw a discount at the customer and make the f customer feel good. What about for seller? that offers a discount. When a seller offers a 
purchase discount, and that means the discount is going to be on the invoice, then, wait for it, just a second, then this amount would already reflect that discount. So if it's a quantity discount, so if you buy, you know, one donut, it costs you $1.30, but if you buy six donuts, they all cost you 99 cents. The only thing they're going to show is 99 cents. No, they do not keep track of this type of thing. Because, I don't know. I have no idea, but it's not tracked. The only, the, the thing they really care about tracking, and, and let's talk about this for a minute because that's, that's an important consideration. We talked about why sales returns are tracked, right? Sales returns are tracked because if returns are too high, it indicates to the company that the product is not a reliable product and the company doesn't want to carry it anymore. So when they're tracking sales, whoops, wait one second, here. They track sales discounts. Why do companies track a sales discount? Well, because a sales discount tells companies whether they're offering too much of a discount or too little of a discount. So let's say very few customers take the discount. That tells the company that 1% is too low. Let's say almost everybody takes the discount. That tells the company that the 1% is too high. So it gives them information about the amount of the sales discount that they give would be an issue for sales margin, not an accounting issue. Uh, absolutely, if you're offering discounts at the front end, then it's going to affect your gross profit. Okay, so everybody understands sales discounts? And we can move on, we got the 28th, and the 28th we were talking about the sales allowance, so we know that this is going to be a debit to sales returns and allowances. And just think about the mattress when you're thinking about sales returns and allowances. And then a credit to, of course, accounts receivable because the accounts receivable is going to go down. All right. So on May 4th, we uh, receive payments from the sale on April 23rd. So of course, on May 4th, we're going to do our usual process, right? So the first uh, thing is to determine, are we in the discount period? And so we've got, it's May 4th right now, April 23rd. And this is where it gets a little complicated because remember that the terms for that sale on the 23rd was 10. Well, I can't take 10 and add it and, and get 33. That just doesn't work. So often I end up just writing it out, the 23rd, the 24th, the 25th, the 26th, the 27th, the 28th, 29th, 30th, 30 days after September, April, June, yep, then 1st, 2nd, third, right? Um, so where do we end up? We, we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The last day, is it the last day? Let's see. Did I count this wrong? 23rd? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten. No, I was right. Third. Oh wow. Payment on the first. Uh, yes, for some reason I was thinking the third was in. Fourth, no discount. No discount. Excellent. Okay, so if there's no discount, exactly, it would be 11 days. Um, so if there's no discount, then we have to make the entry for the payment. What's my debit? What's my credit? I got a debit to cash. How much? Careful, Mark. Here is where I catch students, right? 
because there was $150. So always do that step two, just to be sure. That was $5,600 minus $150, which is equal to $5,450. So be careful there. There's a debit to cash for $5,450, and there is a credit to accounts receivable for $5,450. All right, any issues with anything we did or you're feeling fairly confident about merchandising? I've, I've demonstrated everything that can possibly happen in a company. Um, there's nothing that I can think of that we are missing. So what do we got for balances? I'm going to jump back to my lovely T accounts. Oops, no, I'm a little bit, jumped a little bit too far. There we go. Here's my T accounts. What I need is I need some balances in the bottom of whatever T accounts you have. I think we have an accounts payable. So what do you got for totals? I'm going to jump to the end because I'm going to start doing the trial balance. And this was the company name was Grand Slam Tennis Shop. I'm going to do the trial balance. And this, of course, is um, we're actually on May 4th, 2017. I've got my account. I've got my debit. I've got my credit. I'm going to start, of course, with cash. And then I'm going to have, I don't know if I've got accounts receivable. I know I'm going to have inventory and supplies. Is there any accounts receivable? No, I think we paid all of the accounts receivable off. So I think accounts receivable is going to be zero. So now I'm going to do inventory. I've got supplies. Supplies I already know. I know it's going to be 1,300. Inventory and cash, I have no idea. You guys are up for that. And then I think accounts payable are going to be zero. So I'm going to put common shares, which I know, of course, is going to be 6,000. I'm going to have retained earnings. Uh, 7,400. I'm going to have sales. Don't know how much those are. You guys have got to tell me. Sales. So, Returns and allowances. I'm going to have sales discounts. And I'm going to have cost of goods sold. And then I'm going to have, oh, freed out. And then total. And if, I, if you guys have done everything correctly, our totals should match each other. Freight out, I'm pretty certain, was $100. And then everything else, I have no idea. So I'll wait for you guys. Whenever you have any balances, let me know. Cash is 12158 Okay, wait a minute. Cash is 12,158. I hope I'm getting confirmation about it. Okay, good. Mark's got the same. 4,194. There we go. So we've got cash, inventory, supplies. We've got common shares, retained earnings. I still need sales. Sales returns and allowances. I think there was more than one entry there. Sales discounts, I vaguely remember. Oh, sales, 11,400. Just waiting for confirmation. Does everybody agree it's 11,400? That's weird though because sales discount is 58. 
uh, sales discount is a debit account, 58. I was pretty sure, okay, Andrew's got 12,400. I thought it was 5,000 and something and 6,000 and something. So 11,000 sounds a little low. So we got 12,400? Okay. Mark and Andrew are both saying 12,400 for sales. Ah, but returns go into sales returns and allowances. We're not allowed to put them in sales revenue. So sales is 12,400. Sales returns and allowances. We still need sales returns and allowances, which is 1,000. Is sales returns and allowances 1,000? Ah, 11.50. And the only thing I need is cost of goods sold. Six eight four zero. Somebody want to confirm six eight four zero? Excellent. Six eight four zero. Now, if we've done everything correctly, the trial balance will balance. Does the trial balance balance? And what is the number? Twenty-five eight hundred, according to Andrew. Confirmation, guys. Just okay. Twenty-five eight hundred. Twenty-five eight hundred. All right. So the last thing I want to do right now, now that we've got this trial balance, is I want to create. The both the single step income statement and the multiple step income statement so that you can see the difference between these. Now, I'm going to add a few expense accounts so that I can clearly show you the difference. These expense accounts don't exist for this company. I'm just adding them for demonstration purposes. So please be aware of that when you're looking at what I'm doing. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the single step income statement. So we've got Grand Slam Tennis Shop. We've got the income statement and we've got the period I can't say year because it's just a period period ending May 4th 2017 I'm going to start off with revenue I'm going to do sales revenue and that is 12,400 I'm going to do less, and I'm going to use a short form, sales returns and allowances. And we agreed, I was writing them down when you guys were giving them to me, 1150. And then less sales discounts. Sorry, I'm using short forms because there's so little space here. Sales discounts, 50, 58. And then, oops, 8. And then I'm going to have net sales. So net sales is going to be the difference. Uh, the net sales is 11192. I'm going to add an account right now. Remember, this account is not on our trial balance, but I want to show it to you for demonstration purposes. I'm going to put interest income of $200. So now this would be 11392. So notice, net sales is still calculated on a single step income statement. I do not put the sales returns and allowances and the sales discounts in the expense section because they're not expenses. They are revenue accounts. They belong in the revenue element. They are simply contra revenue accounts, which do the opposite. But it's still grouping all together. And then this would be total revenue. Then I have an expenses. And you'll see in my expenses, I start with cost of goods sold. So I start with that 6840. And now I'm just going to, and I've got freight out. 
expense, and that would be the $100. And I'm just going to make up some expense. Let's say it's interest expense of $12. Um, loss on sale of equipment. Uh, let's say it's $150. And miscellaneous expenses. And that would be $1,000. So now I've got total expenses. And the total expenses are H102. Um, $6,007. Yes, I believe that's correct. Oh, I thought we were just, wait, 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 wait. So we write all of that out on the single step. Absolutely. I thought we just subtracted it and reoriented the net sales. Um, I'm not going to show you, I'm not going to show you the short form. What expenses under a loss of loss on sale of equipment? Miscellaneous. So I did a miscellaneous expense. Okay. Oh, Chelsea, I just saw you answered. Um, so uh, the net sales, can we put just net sales on there? Yes, we can, but I like to write it out so that everybody's clear exactly how we make up net sales. I don't want to put net sales and then nobody knows where that number came from. So can you only put net sales and then interest income? Yes, you can, but I'm going to write it out. In fact, companies do not show um, the sales returns and allowances and sales discounts because it's proprietary information to your competitors. So you will always put down net sales. But I like to write it out to show you how it's developed. Okay, so now we have profit before income tax expense. And that's the difference between the 11,000 and the 8,102. Um, and this is 3,290. And now I'm going to do income tax expense and 658, let's just assume, and now profit. So you'll notice I've added a few accounts here just for demonstration purposes, 32. Because I want to show you how different the multiple step income statement is. And the only way I can do that is to actually have all these additional accounts in there. Any questions about this? This is very straightforward. Notice the only expense that is separated is the income tax expense. And income tax expense is separate because just to be clear, income tax is separate because it is not under the control of the company, right? Expenses are under the control of the company, but income tax expense is pres prescribed basically by the CRA, and therefore it's always a separate line item. All right, so now let's look at the multiple step income statement. Now, sometimes students will put in brackets multiple step, but actually multiple step income statements are never, ever denoted as such. They're still just called income statements. So no difference in the title. I don't put down revenues. I don't list that at all. I start with sales revenue, which is 12400 I then do less sales returns and allowances. And again, generally this would not show up, but I'm going to put it in here for demonstration purposes. Less sales discounts. Net sales is 11192. And then I do less cost of goods sold. Oops, sorry. Less cost of goods sold, 6840. And then I do gross profit. The gross profit is the difference, 4352. Gross 
profit is an important number to assess a company's profitability and their ability to cover their um, operating expenses. So companies that sell products, they provide information with regards to gross profit. And they also generally provide the gross profit margin percentage, which is gross profit divided by net sales. So if I did that number right now, wait, I'm looking for my calculator. Oh, there it is. So if I calculated the gross profit percentage, it would be 4352 divided by net sales, 11192. That equals to 39%. So again, how did I calculate this? I took 4352 and divided by 11192. And that's the gross profit margin percentage. Notice that I'm dividing it by net sales, not sales revenue, because sales revenue is before returns. And those returns were as if they were never made as a sale. So I always use net sales. So this number is really important because this tells us that for what every $1 they sell, they put 39 cents towards covering their operating costs. The higher the gross profit margin is, the better it is. OK. So now how does it continue? Now they put operating expenses. So notice I'm, I'm differentiating operating expenses. This would be freight out of $100. And it would be the miscellaneous operating expenses of $1,000. So now I've got total operating expenses. That would be $1,100. I'm going to deduct this from the 4,352, and it's going to give me profit from operations, which is important for companies, for, uh, sorry, for analysis of any company. This is what they made from their operations. All their other costs are either financing costs or miscellaneous costs. So I keep those separate. I have an other income slash expenses section. And that's where I put things like interest income of the $200. I put the interest expense. And because I'm mixing expenses with income, I'll put the expenses in bracket. That's the first time I do that. It's because I'm mixing all these things together, so I've got to put brackets around the things that are expenses and no brackets around the things that are um, an inflow of income. So then I do the loss on sale of equipment. And that, again, would be in brackets, 150. So this is my total other income and expenses. And again, I'll put it way over here. This is now $38. And so here it is. I'll have profit before income tax. Well, guess what? Profit before income tax expense should be identical. It should be 3290. So notice this. I just want to highlight it for a moment. So this part and this part is identical, right? This part from here all the way down, it's going to be exactly the same down here. I'm just going to finish it in two seconds. Could you make the assumption that miscellaneous is, is an other expense? Uh, no, it's unlikely that it's a mi miscellaneous is an other expense because other expenses are transitory expenses. These or financing. So they're going to be financing costs or they're going to be transitory. Transitory means they happen infrequently. So I wouldn't take the miscellaneous as happening infrequently. Um, I'm going to do the income tax expense, which is exactly the same, 658. And then I'm going to do the profit, which is 2632. So notice something that's really, really important. The bottom number is the same. 
There's no difference. None at all. The, in the end, the profit is the same between these two statements. All that has happened is we have categorized or grouped this, the expenses and the revenues in a slightly different manner to provide more information to the users of the financial statements. Remember that one of our requirements, one of our enhancing qualitative characteristics is understandability. By creating a multiple step income statement, we improve the understandability of the information we are providing to our external users. And that's what we really want to do. So companies that are merchandising companies or manufacturing companies that sell products, the main source of their revenues is the sale of products, will use a multiple step income statement. And to, to get a, a look at this, just go on to Google and Google um, Dollarama. Dollarama is a perfect example. Now, they're not going to sell on account. I mean, Donorama sells everything for, you know, cash um, or credit or, or debit, whatever. But even when they sell on credit, they get paid by the credit card companies by the end of the day. So they, it's equivalent to cash. Uh, so for them, looking at their income statement, you'll see right away that they have a multiple step income statement. Thank you so much for joining me again for this webinar. Take care of yourselves and have a great week.